biologist of all time, Robert Schreiber, who applied mathematics in a high, who applied trivial mathematics in a highly non-trivial way. And I'm going to hear about it. Um. <laughs> Actually, I left some feature in my talk somewhere, but it's on this computer if it'll turn on. Okay, this is going to be real simple, and there's two reasons for that. The first, as I used to joke when I got into this field 35 years ago, evolutionary theory was so poorly developed as a discipline that fractions and logic would get you through most situations. And I'm afraid we're not a hell of a lot further along than that. Fractions and logic will still get you through most situations. There's been some progress in some uh, limited areas, but mostly we suffer from what a number of disciplines suffer from uh, when math first gets introduced. That is, those with slight mathematical talents dress up their paper with equ papers with equations so as to look more complicated and more scientific. In other words, they use it as a, as a device of self-promotion and camouflage. And there's no content specifically in the math. Indeed, content is usually hidden uh, from view. And another thing that happens, and economics provides, if not endless, at least numerous examples of this, is they will solve something in economics that was already solved in physics like 400 years before. And yet, because it's in a novel context, they will pretend to give it new meaning, but in doing so, they have to make elementary mistakes in logic. So certainly as mathematicians, we all, and I'll pretend for the next hour I'm one of you, we all know that mistakes at the foundation are the most important and far-ranging. To give you just one little example of this uh, game economists have played, this is a, an argument I had with Paul Samuelson years ago just after he got his Nobel Prize, which he then paraded around everywhere he went, uh, as you might expect. So he got an argument with me about sex ratio theory. Now, sex ratio theory could not be simpler. If a male and a female cost the same to produce, then one-to-one -one sex ratio at hatching, or when they're produced, uh, is the ESS. It's the equilibrial uh, stable uh, strategy uh, which cannot be displaced by anything else. And it's easy enough to see why. If someone, if, if everyone's producing one to three, then a male's reproductive success is expected to equal three times a female's reproductive success. And therefore, a parent is now selected to add, to produce sons instead of daughters in order to get these extra grandchildren. And of course, it's just the other way around if it's three to one. Now a male's RS is one-third that of a female, and parents are selected to produce the underrepresented sex. So natural selection acting on individual parents favors them producing uh, a one-to-one -one sex ratio, or slightly more accurately, favors everyone producing sex ratios that will average out to one-to-one, -to -one, at which point there's no particular bias in favor of any sex ratio. So what does Paul Samuelson do? Paul Samuelson reproves the notion that if you have 50 red balls and 50 blue balls in some big space bouncing around at random, then you maximize, well, if you have 100 that can be either red or blue, I should have said, you maximize the chance that a red and a blue will collide if there's 50 of each. <laughs> if there's only one red and 99 blue, that red will always combine uh, always collide with a blue, but almost all the rest of the blues, 98 of them, on that instance will collide with each other. So it's absolutely trivial that to maximize collision rate, uh, uh, one to one is the optimal uh, sex ratio or optimal ratio of balls. It has nothing to do with natural selection acting on the sex ratio. Natural selection is not trying to optimize collision rates of males and females in nature. That's a brute characteristic, not an individual characteristic, and the classic uh, corrosive assumption in evolutionary theory ever since Darwin, and we're still trying to beat, beat it out wherever it pops up again, is that evolution evolves at some higher level than the individual 
and, and or his or her genes. The group, the species, the ecosystem, the universe, if you really want to lose all moorings to reality. Okay, so let's deal with fractions now and, and kinship theory. Now, kinship theory is, is the only important advance in our understanding of evolution since Darwin. Darwin said uh, there's variance in reproductive success in every species. Some individuals produce many surviving offspring, many fewer none. By definition and logic, the genes of those producing many become more numerous. The genes of those producing fewer none become less numerous. That's the end of the subject. So all we have to do to understand life is understand how natural selection has worked on our traits and imaginary other traits for many, many uh, millions of years. Now, by logic, though, the, uh, we're not only related to our children. So it was Hamilton's advance in 1964 to extend this system and say, wait a second. You're equally related to your full sibs, your brothers and your sisters, under outbreeding this is, as you are to your own children. So in principle, natural selection can favor you having no surviving offspring if by doing so you add more brothers and sisters to the world than children you would have had. Okay? So he adopted an extended reproductive success or extended genetic success where you still were maximizing a single number, that is your number of surviving offspring, plus your effects on relatives, reproductive success, with each effect being devalued by the relevant degree of relatedness. So as I mentioned, if you're considering an effect on a full sibling, you have to devalue the effect by a half compared to the same effect on yourself, because you're fully related to self, half related to future sibling. Fine. So that's the foundation for all of evolutionary logic. It ain't been changed since then. And that's where fractions come in. Now, how exactly do we define degree of relatedness? That's all I want to talk about now for the next 10, 15 minutes. How do we define it? What difference do slight uh, differences in our definition make? So here's a recent paper published in either Nature or Science by Martin Nowak who apparently reserves space in those journals because every three months there's another new paper that's coming up. And this one was particularly uh, full of nonsense regarding the evolution of youth sociality that created a whole uh, storm and drunk. Anyway, let's just, let's just look at his definition of R, or what I call degree of relatedness, and I'll define it in a moment. But he defined it as the fraction of the genes shared by the altruist and the recipient due to their common descent. I would not define it that way. I would define it as a conditional probability. If I have a gene, what is the probability, given that I have it, that this gentleman here has an identical copy of the gene uh, by descent from a common ancestor? This is slightly different. And this reminds me of a brief little quasi-literature that grew up and unfortunately died very quickly when people took the fraction approach instead of the uh, conditional probability approach. So, for example, there were some people that said, look, we're all, as parents, we're related to each child by a half, period. Because if meiosis is working properly, it's always taking one of the parental chromosomes or one of the sections of the parental chromosomes and sticking them in uh, one sperm cell or egg and the other in another one. And it's doing this exactly 50-50 because that's how meiosis works. So there's no variance in degree of relatedness as you look at your children. It's all half, 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 half. Of course, there may be variance in the ability of your children to convert investment in them into grandchildren, that's another matter. But they then continued and said, ah, but there is variance in the fraction of your genes that are, uh, that are uh, shared with a sibling. Because here you have independent assortment going on, and you can have uh, you know, slightly more than 50% of your genes in a sibling, or slightly less than 50% in the, uh, in the sibling. The fact that you have 23 independently assorting chromosomes and in fact crossing over within them that virtually doubles the number of chromosomes means that those deviations are pretty damn small. 
But nevertheless, it was big enough for some people to say, ah, we expect siblings to d differentiate among themselves according to how related they really are. Try to beat this, this conditional probability by actual knowledge of how many of your genes happen to be shared by chance with a sibling, even though the chance for any given one is a half. The problem with that is, is that you still have to imagine a gene that decides to make this measurement. And this gene is going to be found in the other individual with a chance of a half. The information about other genes that happen to have gotten uh, by chance assorted to this sibling uh, more or less frequently than 50-50s are relevant to what's happening at this locus that you're imagining is making the measurement. So we thought that that was probably uh, a false lead uh, really going nowhere. Now, um, okay, okay, now there's a larger problem of identity uh, by descent. Um, why is that uh, our criteria? Why did we say degree of relatedness is a conditional probability that you have a gene that I have by descent from a common ancestor? Why don't we just talk about the chance that you have that gene, period? Uh, well, that led to a whole blossoming theory that died after eight or ten years. Um, uh, pain, painlessly, I imagine, or never mind the pain in it. Uh, that was called genetic similarity theory. So that's, uh, that's back to the sibling fallacy, only that's writ up large for our genotype itself. And that says, hey, look, I've already shared most of my genes with you all because we're human beings. So degree of relatedness already starts at point 0.9, if you will. But that is foolish on the face of it. Again, when you imagine that a mutation appears to act altruistically toward a given uh, category of individual, uh, like a half-sibling, then it is irrelevant that it appeared in a species where individuals already share 95% of their genes in common because they have two legs, two arms, two eyes, and a whole series of other things in common. Okay, you say, I'll go along with that, but what about at the locus itself? What about at the locus controlling your imaginary altruistic act? Surely, uh, when you first have the gene pop up, you can talk about identity by de descent from a direct ancestor. Actually, there's a slight delay before you can. When it first pops up, it won't be found in, in a sibling. It has to pop up and two or three generations go by before it shows that uh, kinship structure. But give us that. Then it starts at low frequency. Now it's being favored whenever benefit times R is greater than C, which for the full sib case would be whenever uh, the benefit is greater than twice the cost, uh, the gene will start to spread by logic. Okay, fine. Now, as it spreads at that locus, it is no longer found there infrequently. Indeed, it may reach 50% frequency, or it may reach 99% frequency. Surely, if, we're, if it's reached 50% frequency, then the conditions for its further spread should be relaxed because it has achieved a frequency already. No. Once again, that turns out to be a logical error. And one way to conceptualize it, I think, is a simple drawing that's meant to refer to one locus a, a locus is, is a, a location along uh, paired chromosomes, and so we have an, where there's typically a gene or an allele at each of the uh, places on this chromosome. So here's a locus, and it's a locus that affects uh, how you act towards your full sibling, let's say. Now, you've got the gene, okay, by definition or by assumption because you're an altruist in this situation. Now, what about the paired one here? Well, let's say that it has reached 30% frequency, but as we all know, we can make this general. So we'll simply say its frequency is P, that it's present, and 
1 minus p, 1 minus p, its absent. 